Hello and welcome, everybody. Welcome to another webcast from Black Hills Information Security. This is a special one because we get to release a new toolkit. Ha, I'm kidding. We actually released it at Wild West Hacking Fest. Y'all are late. If you want to be up on the newest, coolest stuff, you need to come to Wild West Hacking Fest. But we do want to release it today. Um, we have released a number of tools over the years. We used to have this shirt that said proudly sucking at capitalism and has all the tools on the back. Um, we're going to have to add another one, which also comes with a really cool logo, by the way. Love the Blade Runner design. And it deals with something we've been talking about consistently in webcasts and in news segments, that if you're looking forward to the future, the concept of using the endpoint as a means of entry to an organization is getting harder and harder and harder. If you're looking at an endpoint for persistence, that is getting harder and harder and harder, and there needs to be more investigation into cloud technologies. And Bo started with this whole thing, um, started building the uh, started building the tool Graph Runner out, and then Steve jumped in and helped, and it became very, very quickly. I almost think Bo, this is record time uh, that a tool uh, from like the concept to being released. Uh, getting it out there, by the way, that doesn't mean it's buggy and we skipped a bunch of steps. Uh, no, it's actually really good. So trust us on this. Um, but it really is allowing us as a company in Black Hills Information Security and our pen testing activities to focus on cloud exploitation and post-exploitation and then re-exploitation activities. Um, and it also can be a very helpful tool for anybody that's trying to defend their cloud infrastructures for Office 365 to be able to check for those vulnerabilities before the dastardly hackers come and do it. And with that, I want to hand it over to Bo and Steve for the rest of the webcast. Take it away, gentlemen. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much, John. Uh, Thank you. So welcome, everybody. Uh, stoked to have all of you hanging out today and uh, you know, get to show you some new, some exciting new stuff we've been working on. Um, so as John mentioned, you know, we, uh, so we, we, if, if you came to Wild West Hacking Fest, if you, if you were there, um, you, you may have seen this talk, uh, it's pretty much going to be an identical thing to what we did at Wild West Hacking Fest, but that was also not, um, you know, publicly streaming the internet. So we wanted to give everyone, uh, the ability to see, uh, this presentation. So, uh, that's what we're doing here today. Um, this is our, our basically release, uh, talk for this new tool that we wrote called Graph Runner. So, you know, this was, as John mentioned, you know, he, it's funny, he said that like record time between, um, you know, building and releasing it, but in all honesty, it was like, it was months of work. Um, and, and to, to be completely blunt, years of just, you know, learning various APIs and like kind of the cloud, how, how the cloud works in general. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a lot of effort. It wasn't just like, you know, a couple of weeks worth of work and then, uh, and then release. Um, but uh, yeah, so Basically today, we're going to talk about the tool where I'm going to show you a bunch of demos. Um, Steve is going to talk about some really cool bypasses that we end up finding. Um, it, it's, it's very interesting how we ended up, we ended up going down like just rabbit hole after rabbit hole um, in building this thing. You know, Corey, Corey was on earlier um, and, you know, basically he was working a, a job for uh, one of our continuous pen testing customers. And um, so he, he came to me, he was like, hey, you know, one of our CPT customers, um, is interested in trying to simulate that, uh, you know, type of threat actor uh, of the uh, Storm 0558 uh, threat actor where they, you know, stole the signing keys and were able to sign, create tokens, and then read email from various accounts. So, you know, while we don't have that capability, right, like we can't go, you know, obviously like sign our own tokens, we can leverage tokens to carry out uh, similar types of access um, to, to resources. So that was one of the, 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 starting points basically it's like hey all right so we have we have this thing that we want to try um and so we ended up building out some modules around that and then that really is is where the the catalyst for um for diving so so much into uh graph came from so let me uh pull up the slide with our quick bios uh so myself i'm uh bo bullock um you pinned us to red team here at black hills um, i also teach a cloud hacking class called breaching the cloud and then we've also got steve steve borsch Hello. Yep. So Steve Borsch here, also a pen tester, a red teamer, researcher, continuous pen testing or anti-SOC as we call it, uh, tester. Um, also teach uh, enterprise attack initial access on anti-SOC. So check that out. We do a lot of this token stuff in there as well for the initial access. All right. So quick roadmap for today. Um, <clears throat> I, I will warn you, there's a lot of content and I, you know, when we did it live, um, you know, while I was talking about this, we got it done in the, in the amount of time specified, but it was quick. Uh, so just, you know, quick warning, there's a lot of stuff to show you. There's lots of, uh, moving pieces in graph runner. 
Um, and I like to, I like to at least kind of dive into, you know, the background of why we built certain things too. Uh, so it's not just, Hey, here's this, you know, tool that can do this function, you know, go run this, um, understanding the why I think is really key. So we're gonna talk about what graph runner is first of all, then, uh, there's four main sections. So we're gonna talk about how we can use it to authenticate. We're gonna use it for recon and enumeration. Uh, there's a number of persistence te uh, techniques that we're going to dive into. And then ultimately, we'll talk about how it has uh, various capabilities for pillaging an account as well. So what is Graph Runner? So Graph Runner is a Microsoft Intra ID uh, and or Microsoft 365 post-exploitation tool set. So I say tool set because it is actually multiple moving pieces. It's not just like one script. Um, and the the majority of the modules all leverage the graph api so microsoft's graph api is something we're going to talk about as well it's if you if you open up uh pretty much any 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 piece of microsoft 365 infrastructure you know you go, go visit your email um you know visit the, the azure portal usually you'll see some calls out to the api like it's underneath pretty much everything um <clears throat> and then we'll dive into the in individual modules as well all right so some of the main pieces uh the primary piece of Graph Runner is a PowerShell script um, that contains multiple modules for post compromise. So uh, one big thing to keep in mind is that this is not a tool to go and get you access uh, to an account, right? It's not an initial compromise type of tool. Um, it is 100%, you know, after you've compromised a cred, uh, what can we do with that cred? And it's actually funny, we were talking about yesterday um, uh, on, another, on another webcast about how <clears throat> Basically, like the the concept of uh, or Microsoft's concept of what is actually a vulnerability, um, pretty much drops after the point where you've gained authentication. So if it's something where it's a functionality of you know a user who is authenticated to an account, uh, the majority of the time Microsoft doesn't think like there's like a vulnerability there necessarily, right? It's like oh you got access, well you know they shouldn't have got access in the first place. So anyways, a lot of the modules uh, in this tool are pretty much just leveraging functionality that's meant to exist, right? Um, all right, so Graph Runner GUI, it does have a graphic piece as well, graphic user interface piece uh, that can be helpful, which will show you that. And then finally, uh, there are uh, multiple pieces to help with OAuth flow. So one of the big pieces uh, that I want to talk about today is an OAuth uh, illicit consent grant attack, uh, which you know historically has been really, really devastating. Um, it got kind of kind of tied back a little bit uh, when Microsoft started kind of reining it in. Um, but I'm going to show you some interesting ways that we can still leverage that type of attack and ultimately how we can complete those OAuth flows. All right, the Graph API, right? So um, I don't know, Steve, do you wanna, you wanna take the Graph API? Sure, um, so we originally started with Graph API version one, which was uh, graph.windows.net. Uh, and recently it's moved to version two and there's, now there's a beta. So Graph uh, basically is the API that we can access, get tokens for and access various services based on uh, like the app's client ID, uh, so a GUID, and then the resource, so like graph.windows.net or graph.microsoft.com or uh, api.skype.something. Uh, so depending upon the resource you want, uh, you match it up with the client ID and request uh, a token or sign in with password off, and then you get access to those services. So you can do things like search team, search SharePoint, uh, depending on the type of token you have. So I uh, wrote the tool with Bobby Cook called Token Tactics originally. Uh, gave us the power to swap tokens between services. So from like uh, Teams to SharePoint to, um, you know, whatever, just reading Azure Active Directory at the time or Entra ID uh, email as well. So send, receive emails, all kinds of cool stuff. So Graph is very powerful. It's basically the API that lets us do things. And Bo's done some really great research on finding undocumented APIs to uh, target as well. Yeah. 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 So, you know, like, like Steve said, it, it pretty much is the, the architecture for everything, like on, on, on the underneath side of like how Azure works, how, how M365, it, it, it pretty much touches everything. Um, uh, like anything you could want to do, um, within an account, you can probably do with the API itself. So <clears throat> authentication, uh, is a, is a key part here, right? <clears throat> so again, uh, the concept of this is we're leveraging an account that we've already compromised, right? So that could be that could be from you know the point of uh, maybe we fish somebody and we're you know operating a session as them, right? Mm -hmm. So browser session, maybe something like an Evil Gen X uh, type of reverse proxy fish, right? 
Um, or maybe we password sprayed somebody and you know somehow got around MFA um, or somehow we're sitting in a browser session as them, right? Could could be physical mm-hmm. access, right? Maybe we walked up to their desktop um, and we're sitting in, you know, in their in front of their system. Um, but real quick on that, Bo, you can actually take the token generated, the device code, and send that as a fish or something. So you can kind of bridge it with initial access, um, but you got that 15 minute wait period that we'll maybe talk about later. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Yeah, yeah. So device code phishing absolutely um, would would be a great initial access method here too. Um, <clears throat> so there's a few methods to to basically tie over that session that we've compromised to Graph Runner itself. Um, the main one is via device code auth, like Steve just mentioned. So um, in the device code auth case, um, <clears throat> we are generating just a device code auth flow um, on our own client side and leveraging the already authenticated browser to complete uh, that device code flow, and then ultimately gaining access to access tokens within the, the terminal context. Um, and it looks similar to this, where we have a module called git dash graph tokens. When you run that, it will give you the uh, the code that you need to take to microsoft.com slash device login. Uh, and then you leverage the device code flow via device login to uh, to get the, the the tokens within your terminal context. And then from there, uh, we are going to leverage those tokens to to uh, run the majority of the other modules. Uh, let's see, there's a question. How, how much time do you have to authenticate with the device code? So 15 minutes by default, right, Steve? Yeah, unless you use my method for dynamic device code phishing, where you put your uh, device code generation out on an Azure website or other um, hosted platform like Heroku or something like that, uh, which I explained in my class. And I think I've got some, I have a blog on BHIS about it. That extends your 15 minute window from the time you send the code to the person, say via Fish or Teams message, to now you send them a link to your site that generates the code. So whenever they visit, they could be at lunch, whatever, in a meeting, they come back, they see your email, they go to the site, then the 15 minutes starts. So you have a better chance of um, getting them at, at that point. Yeah. And then the other question was, uh, would device code auth bypass MFA? In a lot of cases, yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, because they're using their MFA to sign in. And then you receive that in your JWT as part of the scope package, right? That you've yep. authenticated with MFA. The main detection piece there is if you're using um, device code phishing out on the cloud or something, the IP address comes in as maybe a risky sign in from, say, AWS or something like that. So there's some caveats to it. Yeah, so for those that aren't, aren't familiar with device code flows, um, the best way to describe it is is basically if you've ever signed into your TV, right, and you've logged into something like Netflix or Hulu or Disney Plus on your TV, um, most of the time you don't want to use like your remote control to like type out a long password, right? Like, so what they what they decided to do is like, well, okay, well, what if we just give them a code and then they can take that to their phone where they're already authenticated on their phone or laptop where they're already authenticated. You enter the code and then now magically your TV is authenticated too, and so. Azure, Microsoft have that exact same flow as well, where you can basically create this code that just makes it so that you take that to another browser where you're already authenticated, put it in there, and then now magically your mm-hmm. uh, your your browser where you generated the device code is now authenticated too. All right, so we're up to recon and enumeration. So we're going to get into some of the modules now. Um, what it actually you know does, right? What what Graphner actually does. So we have we've already authenticated. Now let's leverage those tokens to do some things like enumerating configurations. Um, gathering apps and consent approval. So um, pull, being able to pull app registrations, which you'll see is a, kind of a big part of uh, the persistence flow uh, with, with GraphRunner as well. The ability to dump conditional access policies, um, <clears throat> which can be useful uh, for an attacker to understand other methods they might be able to uh, you know, get around uh, certain protections. Uh, pull you know, lots of different types of information around users, groups, uh, SharePoint sites, um, and identify potential attack uh, paths. All right, so invoke dash graph recon uh, is one of the first modules that if um, you know if you if you compromise an account, this is going to give you a lot of information around uh, what you can actually do. Um, so this gives you this will give you a lot of the the settings that ultimately the later sections of this this presentation we're going to leverage to exploit. Uh, so first off, things like is um, directory sync enabled, right? Is is uh, you know is the tenant leveraging something uh, to sync credentials from on-prem up to the cloud and vice versa. Um, and then the the user settings themselves. So to, to me, like these are some of the m- more critical things to look at. Can users consent to applications? Um, can users read other users? Can, uh, can users create applications? And can they create groups? Which by default, all of these are yes. Um, and that's 
That's another big thing you'll see through the presentation today too, is a, pretty much all the attack surface that we're going to highlight is all default stuff. Um, things that, you know, if you just set up a tenant today, um, you're going to be at risk. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So yeah. Yeah. So Steve, this is, this is your, uh, your baby here, man. Oh yeah. So um, once you gain uh, your initial access or have your token uh, that you've received from graph uh, runner or token tactics or wherever you got it from, um, you can check your scope. So the token will say, Hey, uh, scope like user dot read or whatever. Well, um, what if um, we brute force all, well, we're on a different one. This is a brute force list of the actions with the estimated oh, access. So right. this is yes. yours actually. Yes. Okay, yeah. So we have, we have a couple of brute force modules. <laughs> yeah. A couple of them. So yeah, yeah. So we'll get to that one in a second. Um, this one is in regard to being able to, to learn what permissions you have. Um, so this is actually, this was an interesting thing that um, kind of stumbled upon. So we were talking about how, how, how do we do research, right? How do we, how do we find interesting stuff? And one of the, one of the best ways is literally just like, Pull a burp, right? Throw, throw an intercepting proxy in between your browser and the things you want to interact with. And, you know, in doing that, a lot of times you'll find like various APIs that get hit. And, you know, if you start to kind of poke and dig into those and really like kind of look at the requests, and it's a lot of times you'll find interesting stuff. Anyways, this is one of those cases where um, I ended up finding this estimate access API. So estimate access is it's a location that actually a few of the modules in Graphner leverages now. Um, but what it does is it is a location where you can submit an action. So an action could be something like, can I, um, can I create groups or can I um, invite a guest user? And it will literally um, submit that action and tell you, it'll estimate your access and tell you, will you be able to do that or not? Are you allowed to? So this is an interesting one because be, because of this API, you don't necessarily need to go enumerate those user settings directly. You can leverage this to literally brute force specific actions. Um, and I, I have a list of like 400 actions or so. There's probably more. Again, that's a very R&D centric uh, mm. module. <laughs> um, <laughs> one that, that I think we'll still end up finding interesting stuff with um, after the fact. Um, dumping additional access policies. So there are a couple of other tools that, in, that allow for dumping caps as well. Um, Road tools is one of those. Mm. Um, uh, I think AAD internals also does it as well. Um, but this is something that, you know, for, for us as an attacker can be very, very useful. And additionally, you know, if you're doing like any sort of security audit or if you are, um, uh, if you are, uh, even on the blue team, right. You just want to analyze your caps. Um, this can help at least, at least dump those. So you can, you know, identify any sort of weaknesses there. Um, but the idea is like we compromise an account and we want to know, is there a place where we may be able to, you know, log in single factor, right? Mm -hmm. um, or is there a group that has a different access to different applications than what we currently have access to? Um, so that could be, you know, a method of doing that, right? Dump the initial access. Policy yeah, usually the first two things I'm going to do when I gain access like this is dump all the user UPNs or emails and also dump um, all the caps. That way, if I get booted and then I know maybe some potential ways to get back in and who to fish and things like that. Yep, yep. Yeah, and then the, this one, the application. So, um, so in Azure, you can you can create applications, and these applications are um, not necessarily like you know the traditional context of where you would think of like a web application or like a, a desktop application. Um, it's an application that allows you to create permissions um, for various scoped items <clears throat> that ultimately can be leveraged by um, your authentication flow. So maybe you can leverage it to. Uh, you know, authenticate a user to another application, um, or you can use them directly. So we're going to dive into what types of permissions apps can have later when I uh, talk about the injection of apps. But for now, um, we're going to talk about just kind of enumerating them. And this can be helpful. Uh, like, I, I, I kind of say like, this is like my blue team module uh, for you guys, because we're about to, I'm about to show you how we can inject mm -hmm. malicious apps. This is one of the methods you can use to find them. So with this module, it will help dump the applications as well as the users who have consented to those applications and the uh, the scope of permissions to which those users have consented. So if you had an external application or even an internal application that had, let's say something like the ability to read email, um, you could kind of go through this list and you know try to identify those, uh, those ones that are there. Um, all right, so another module uh, that I'm, we're gonna talk about here is uh, one that is, it ties directly back to something I wrote back in uh, like 2017. Um, for Mail Sniper. So Mail Sniper back then, uh, one of the techniques that we were leveraging and have been leveraging for years now is to read other users' inboxes. So 
the thing that's crazy to me still, like, you know, after all these years is that it's so easy for users to basically give access from their inboxes to other, other users in a company. It's, it's insanely easy. So it's literally these, this, this slide, right? So if you open up your inbox, right click inbox, click properties, and then on the right, um, you, uh, you see that default option, right? Under permissions. So, um, like right here default. So if you change default to literally anything else, except none that creates a setting that allows anybody at the company to read your email. And so, you know, there's, there's lots of reasons why, um, you know, employees, like maybe a CEO needs like, uh, you know, somebody to read their email. Actually, we were joking earlier about, um, how mm -hmm. Devin Jason run, uh, you know, certain accounts that <laughs> they have to respond to. Um, and you know, like that, it happens, right? Like, um, where, where, you know, you have, uh, you know, C-suite people that need assistance, right. Admin mm -hmm. assistance to read their stuff, but Microsoft puts that power in the hands of every employee, right? So if they make a mistake, then now their email is readable by everybody. I know it sounds crazy, but I promise you that like lots of people do this at organizations. Yeah. Um, like there's lots of assessments will we'll, we'll hit like 30 or 40 inboxes. I don't know um, if I've ever had an assessment I've tested it on that I haven't had another inbox I've been able to access. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, that and, and the, why that's important is like, you know, you have your initial access, but now you can also read other inboxes as well. Mm -hmm. So your initial access literally could be to like 30 or 40 people's inboxes, you know, um, or more, you know, depending on the organization. So anyways, um, Graph Runner has a module called invoke-graph open inbox finder. Uh, so the difference between this one and what MailSniper uh, did is that MailSniper was specifically targeting um, OWA and Exchange Web Services, right? Whereas Graph Open Inbox Finder is directly via the Microsoft Graph. So you can do the exact same exact same technique of, of reading a shared inbox, but through the Graph API this time. All right, this is the one that's Steve, sorry. <laughs> for, for, <laughs> yeah, for so here we go. So um, you gain access, you've got just you know simple scope user impersonation or user or user.read or something, and it's not what you need. Um, you can run brute client ID access and there's a ton more client IDs out there, but we've taken some that we found uh, and put them into the script. So basically, it'll check your tokens access and scope against each of these client IDs. So like Microsoft Office client ID, there we've got audit log read all, but then you go down to some of the other ones and you see we've got like user read write or tasks read write or teams read all, um, even some like device uh, configuration stuff. So what we found is that if you swap tokens to one of those um, client IDs with the graph uh, resource, then you can basically impersonate the rights that that application has and then perform additional things. So whether that's um, signing into the Azure portal, getting new access that you didn't have before, or um, being able to send messages or whatever uh, the scope allows you to do, um, it's been quite powerful. And we have, we've been able to bypass some conditional access, initial conditional access based on the findings that we've had uh, here as well. Yeah, it's been, it's been really interesting. Um, and again, like this is another one of those places that I think there's a lot more R and D uh, behind. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, like, yeah, like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, you know, if you're listening to this and you're like, huh, you know, like I'm, I, I need something to research. Um, there's a lot of stuff in Graph Runner that like can be expanded upon like greatly. Um, like I said, like we went, went down some rabbit holes and a lot of it's, you know, in Graph Runner, but there's still a lot of room uh, for other exploration as well. All right. So ability to join groups. <clears throat> All right. So now we're going to get into some interesting stuff, right? Around groups. Now the group topic right like in general um you know if you think about like an internal on-prem active directory environment right you have groups that you know usually your admins are the ones creating the groups and then adding people to those groups and then giving permissions based off of that again with microsoft's uh, sharing model and the you know wanting to collaborate uh, they've given the power to employees to create groups by default okay by default so now groups can be created via a number of different ways um, but one of the main ways that we tend to see groups created is when in a, a group or a, an employee at an organization creates a team. So if you go to Microsoft Teams and you click create team, um, a lot of things happen. Uh, one of the main things is it will create a Microsoft 365 group. It will create a SharePoint site. It will create a Teams channel and it will ask you, it'll say, hey, do you want this uh, group to be private? Do you want it to be public or do you want it to be org wide? So if it's if you select org wide, um, that will automatically include everybody at the org. 
Um, if you um, select uh, public, that means that anybody in the organization can join that group. And then private means that obviously like you have to manage that. Um, and you know, what employee wants to go about managing, um, you know, group on their own, like, you know, adding people to a group, like that's just way too much work. Um, so what we have seen um, through a lot of customers now is this, 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 uh, what I consider misconfiguration of having these groups that anybody can join. So Microsoft 365 groups um, can uh, ultimately be modifiable, right? Where not only can we join it, but we can add other people to the group too, which is going to come up later when we start to talk about persistence um, via other users. So what, what this ends up doing, what this ultimately like looks like is you end up adding yourself to a group and then now you're automatically dropped into a team's channel for a group that you weren't part of before. Um, like we've done this on assessments, like mm -hmm. just a couple of weeks ago, I did it where I added myself to an IT group. So it's like, it's literally called like information technology. And I got dropped on a team's channel where they were passing back, back and forth, clear text passwords in teams for, for local admin passwords for, for desktops. So this is something that, you know, you know, phishing somebody now externally, you add, start adding yourself to groups you're going to get more access than you previously had. So it's already a method to get access to new stuff um, that wasn't previously visible to you. So we wrote a module called um, git-updatable groups. What this does is it, again, uses that estimate access API um, to go and pull groups that you can potentially modify. So the thing that's interesting about this is that Microsoft 365 groups are not the only groups that you can go modify potentially. So you know, via via Teams, if you open up Teams, you can actually go see groups that you can join. Those are always just Microsoft 365 groups, though. Mm -hmm. But there's there there is a scenario, or there are multiple scenarios where security groups or other groups can um, be misconfigured to allow you to modify those as well. So using this this uh, this method of the estimate access API, you should be able to see more than just those Microsoft 365 groups that you can add yourself to as well. So. Dynamic groups are the next thing uh, that we want to talk about. So dynamic groups are groups that um, have membership rules. So membership rules are basically ways to automatically add uh, users to a group. Uh, so it makes it you know, much easier for an admin to just say, you know what, I know what you know, type of user needs to be in this group. I'm going to make a rule um, that anytime that type of user comes along, they're going to get added to this group. So what these rules uh, end up looking like is something like, um, you know, hey, I have an employee in India, so I'm going to take the location of India from their user attribute and then add them to my group, my, you know, my specific group. Um, <clears throat> in the case of misconfiguration, what if, you know, an admin created a group that is literally taking users with admin in their email address and then adding them to a group called admins, right? Um, so let's say user principal name. So the, the syntax would look something like this, where you have user .user principal name dash contains admin. So in that case, um, if I can invite guests, which again, every user can by default, um, if I can invite guests, I can invite a guest user that has admin in their name, right? So in their email address. So in this case, you know, created, a, created a, an email address called testadmintestadmin at proton.me, right? Invited to the tenant, because of that membership rule, it automatically triggers and will add that, uh, that user to the admins group. So, the module for that in uh, Graphener is called uh, Git Dash Dynamic Groups, and this brings up to the uh, brings us up to the first demo here. So I'm going to pull the uh, pull up a video for that, and we'll walk through that. So I've got a few I've got a few demos for you guys today. Um, this is the first one. Of course, uh, you know, video demo for the sake <laughs> of uh, you know demo gods and and whatnot. And Azure just unexpectedly freezing from time to time. <laughs> yeah. All right. So first up, importing the module. Um, so PowerShell module imported. Um, we're going to use git-graph tokens to, to authenticate our session. So over on the left, we've got a browser, right? So this could be where we fish somebody. This could be our um, you know, uh, you know, session that we have, we have fished with. We're going to do a device code off via that session. So this is realistically how pretty much anytime you open up or run GraphRunner, this is what it's going to look like, right? You're already authenticated in a browser. You generate the device code off, and then you complete the flow and get access to tokens. So now we have tokens uh, available to us in the terminal. So let's look at some groups, right? So we're gonna we were talking about group based attacks. Um, <clears throat> there's a number of groups in this tenant. If we run git dash updatable groups dash tokens dollar tokens, so we have to pass those tokens to it. It will go and identify any of those groups that are updatable for us. Um, so all of these groups that you see on the list here 
I can go modify. I can add myself to them and I could add other users to them as well. So let's say that we wanted to target this next gen team, right? Um, so next gen team, let's uh, let's take a look at it real quick. So I'm, I'm Rick Deckard, right? Sticking with the, the Blade Runner theme here. We're gonna look at the members. We can see Rick Deckard's not a member, right? Currently, I could click that add members button, right? If we go to teams, we see that we don't have a next gen team, right? You know, via the portal, you can't add stuff too, right? Um, <clears throat> yes, Roy. <laughs> <laughs> Got some Blade Runner fans. Um, so in order to add ourselves to the group via the CLI, uh, we can use the invoke dash add group member module, which we pass the group ID. So this is the object ID associated with that group. And then we need to pass our object ID of the user we are currently operating as, which um, there's a few ways to get it with GraphRunner. It's also in the token itself. Uh, so when you authenticate, your object ID is in your token. Uh, when you run that, remember added successfully. We go back to uh, the groups, uh, refresh, and we should see uh, that it's updated with us. Now, again, you know you can do this via the portal if you have access to the portal. A lot of companies have started locking down the portal, though. Um, so we, we do have access uh, via the portal. And if we go back to Teams, we see that we have just dropped ourselves into a brand new team called Next Gen Team, uh, where Roy sent you know a secret message here. Um, so next up, Git Dash Dynamic Groups, right? So Dynamic Groups, this one's uh, a pretty quick module because it literally just goes pulls all the groups uh, and then pulls the membership rules associated with those groups. So the membership rules are what we would go about looking at exploiting here. Um, so the membership rules. Um, you know, they can be very unique, right? There's there's so many characteristics you can tie into membership rules that it does kind of create a little bit of a manual process uh, that we have to kind of go through. Um, so we have to, you know, at least kind of analyze them, try to figure out if there's any sort of abusable scenarios there. So this dynamic admin group, if we go look at the members, <clears throat> we'll see that test admin, test admin there um, that's in the group. And so all I did with that with that user is I literally um, uh, invited that, that user as a guest to the tenant, right? literally just invited a completely remote external account that has admin in the name to the tenant. And because of that dynamic membership rule, it got automatically added to that dynamic admin group. So this is another abusable scenario now um, that we need to, to be aware of if we're doing any sort of Microsoft 365 testing. All right, continuing on. Persistence. All right, so persistence. You know, a lot of a lot of this, like I said, spurred from that initial kind of like um, storm 0558 threat actor kind of scenario. And that's realistically where some of these main persistence modules started with. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, ideally, uh, we want to be able to keep access to an account, right? If we're doing any sort of offensive engagement, we want to be able to um, to keep, keep access. So first off, we're going to talk about the default ability to create groups, the default ability to invite guests, and then the default ability to create apps. All right, creating groups. Now, you know, at, at the core may not like right off the bat sound like a terrible thing, right? You think about like, all right, so what if my, if my users can create groups? They're not going to be per any permissions tied to them. Well, all right. So first off, pollution, right? Like just having like that shadow IT kind of, um, you know, bunch of like, what if I came in your environment and created a million groups, right? Like, are you going to have a good day cleaning that up? <laughs> 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 Probably not. Um, so there's that aspect of it. But then there's uh, watering hole attacks. So this is something that we have been toying around with for a while now, um, with this idea of long-term kind of threat actor thinking around um, creating a group and trying to entice or uh, at least kind of ride the potential for having misconfiguration set to a group that we create. So uh, the way this kind of attack flow works is we create a group that is similarly named to something else, right? And in fact, we can name them identically the same name as other groups. So uh, the module invoke dash security group cloner. With this module, you can create a group that is identically named to another group that's already existing in Microsoft 365. So if there's a group called administrators, you can create another group called administrators. And um, so from a watering hole attack perspective here, what we would do is create a group, um, add the people who are already a member of that, right? And then add ourselves too. And let's show that in a demo. Because I think that, um, I think that like to, to really see the, uh, like like why that is so important um, and, and what what the, I guess like the, the risk there is, is uh, much better demonstrated as like a, a visual aspect, right? Like be able to see it. See it Same from the administrator's point of view, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, so first up, we see there's an administrator's group, right, in this in this tenant. 
Um, we're going to run invoke-security group cloner. And what this one does is it just goes and pulls all the groups, first of all, right? Goes gets a list, gets all the members of those groups, and then allows you to enter a group name that you want to clone. So in this case, um, administrators only has uh, two members currently, has, uh, or, I'm sorry, three members, has Rachel, Tyrell, and Roy um, that are members of the admins group. So we're going to create another group called administrators, and we're going to um, add our current user to clone group. And then ultimately it'll ask you, do you want to create a different user uh, or uh, for the clone group, or do you want to change the name, which we don't want to. We want to just create another identical group and add ourselves. Mm -hmm. So if we refresh the portal now, we see there's two administrators groups, right? Now, one of these has three members. The other one has four, right? Um, this is, let's see, this one is the one that has, uh, let's see, this is the one that has four. So this is the one that has us in it, right? It's hard to tell though, right? Like you can't, I mean, mm -hmm. The only thing like visibly here is the date, right? The date, but then yeah. now let's look at it from the, the admin's point of view, right? So let's say I'm an admin or help desk or you know any, any IT admin or whatever. And I go to do configuration on, on a subscription with an Azure. If I go to access control IM, right? Go to create a, a role-based um, assignment for, a, for a, a resource. So in this case, uh, we click add, add role assignment. And... We, we're going to create a job function role, or sorry, a, pr a privileged admin role of owner. Um, so let's say we want to make you know uh, somebody an owner of the account. It's the admins; they should be owners, right? So we add the owner role, and then we go to select members. Now this is where it gets interesting, right? You select members, and you see, look, there's two admins. It's like, all right, well, which one am I going to choose? How about I just like click both of them? You know, like how much <laughs> doesn't preview who's in there or the creation date that it did before? No. Nope. Exactly. See, that's the thing. It's 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 hard to tell, right? Like, there's no right. there's no visible clarity on what that group is, right? Um, so, same thing on SharePoint, right? So, the exact same thing. If you go to SharePoint's admin center and you go to create um, a membership role here, right? Site admins. You go to add site admins and you search, right? Same thing. Administrators, administrators. It's like, all right, well, am I going to really dig into that? Do I have time to go dig into like mm -hmm. who's in these groups or much more? You know, so when I talk about like long term threat actor thinking, right, watering wholesale attacks. Now, imagine a threat actor that is in your environment, right, and they do something like this and then they just wait, right? They literally don't do anything else except just wait. So, you know, like what are, what are the chances that somebody makes a mistake and adds in a group like that? All right. So guest users. All right. This is going to this is going to be more fun. All right. So by default. As many of you maybe are already are already aware, you can invite external uh, accounts to your tenant, right? So you can invite get these guest users. Now, when it comes to why that can be a risk, so first off, I'm going to tell you uh, from a persistence perspective why this creates a really bad persistence mechanism. Um, but also, <clears throat> you have that user inventory group pollution issue, and then the group based privilege escalation um, that we kind of tie talked about a little bit previously ties in here as well. So the module is invoke invite guest. Um, so that'll invite guests to tenants. But what's interesting is that um, <clears throat> historically, when you were a guest, uh, you used to be able to just go to the Azure portal and see users and groups and that kind of thing. Um, they've they've at least cut that level of access off, which is nice, right? Um, <clears throat> but what if we were to combine a, an invited guest with the get dash updatable groups module that I just showed you, right? So what if we were to um, identify <clears throat> groups that we can update or modify, right? Remember that I said that not only can you add yourself, but you can add other people, right? So we invite a guest and we add them to those other groups, right? So a lot of those groups, they drop you in SharePoint, they drop you in Teams. Um, they, they may get added to other policies uh, for other stuff. Occasionally, <clears throat> actually it's funny, um, uh, Moses uh, uh, tweeted at me earlier today and was like, hey, what about you know on sync uh, or on-prem sync? You know, so like there's the, the uh, there is a potential for uh, groups to be synced on prem as well too. Yeah. So what what that ultimately leads to though is now as my external guest user account, if I authenticate to Teams, I can see the Teams chat, I can see the directory. Um, that is persistence. Like, how much are you going and cleaning up those guest accounts, right? Like that's realistically what it comes down to. All right, then we're going to get into OAuth apps. Um, <laughs> This is going to go, sorry, this, like, we've got a lot more still to cover. And I feel like we're already like 30, 34, I know, uh, right? or 39 minutes through. Um, all right. So Azure OAuth apps. Um, so an, an application, like I mentioned in Azure, 
is a is a, an ability to assign permissions or a scope of permissions to an application that can be leveraged by a user um, or by an application itself. So <clears throat> this is something that we used to fish with a lot hi historically, um, because the attack is basically I create an app in my tenant, right? Give it permissions, and then I send you a link and try to get you to consent to those permissions, right? And that box on the right there that's on the, in the screenshot is what it looks like, right? You get a box that says, hey, this application would like access to da 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 And if you click accept, then now that application has that access. So Microsoft has put a lot of protections in place to stop that, to basically cut that off. Um, there's one permission that is still kind of useful um, in the external application context, right? So if I create an application outside of your tenant and I go to fish your users, um, user.readbasic.all is still a decent permission because that will at least get you the directory. Okay, still not great. Um, <clears throat> there's a there's also well known applications out there that you can consent to too. This comes in handy if you are um, <clears throat> in in need of certain permission scopes uh, that you don't currently have. You can you can actually consent to those uh, via the Graph Explorer, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> but what if we were to create an application in your own tenant, right? So having the default ability. Um, to create apps is actually like a really interesting attack opportunity for an attacker. So again, default ability, right? Any user can create an app registration or an application, AKA service principle uh, within your tenant. And so from a persistence perspective, we create that app, apply permissions that don't require admin consent, which a lot of them don't. Things like reading email, things like reading your, your files, SharePoint stuff. Um, and then we consent to it ourselves as the compromised account, right? So not necessarily phishing with it, uh, but we're leveraging it for persistence. So invoke dash inject OAuth app, um, this, this, uh, this module automates the deployment of an app registration. Um, so again, you could do all this via the portal, <clears throat> go in there, you can manually click around and create it. Um, we've automated a lot of that. So it's basically just like one, one command injects the app, gives you the consent link, um, and also has uh, an ability to <clears throat> consent to it locally. So this is another demo for you. So um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that I, you know, I think I was talking with Corey about like early on was this uh, concept about like if we fish somebody and we were to deploy an app quickly, you know, how how like what what would be the most useful thing there? And <clears throat> you know, I, I started digging into some of the permissions that don't require um, admin consent, and ended up hard coding a lot of those into a a scope that I just called OP backdoor, so overprivileged backdoor. Um, but I'll walk you through the command here. So invoke dash inject OAuth app. We give it an app name. So we're going to call it, you know, when defend for M365. So it blends in nicely, right? Uh, give it a reply URL of the localhost scope OP backdoor. The reason I gave it localhost is because um, when we consent to it, since we are the ones uh, consenting to the application ourselves, we're going to actually redirect that to localhost. Uh, where we're going to set up a listener. So the tool will actually spit out a another command called invoke dash auto OAuth flow, that blue one at the bottom. What that does is it takes the client ID, the secret, the, all the permissions, the redirect uh, URI command, and throws it in a nice, uh, easy, single command that you can copy over to another browser uh, where Graph Runner has already been imported. So if we go to the other, um, I'm sorry, the other terminal, uh, import import uh, Graph Runner, then we're going to run that invoke auto OAuth flow module. What that will do is it spins up a localhost listener that we can then take and uh, complete that OAuth flow. So Whenever you consent to an application, uh, a lot of things happen, but the main thing is that it will redirect you with an OAuth code to the redirect URI. So we visit that link. Um, you'll see there's a ton of permissions, right? We're going to accept them because we're we're basically creating this persistence on our own account, right? Like we're not worried about somebody else seeing it. Um, and when it completes the OAuth flow, you get access tokens, right? So these access tokens are what we can then leverage under the context of the service principle itself. Um, so not not directly via the um, the user's credential, but at like under the context of the service principle application that we we injected. So now we could run something like invoke dash graph open inbox finder um, with those tokens of the application, um, and we're going to give it a user list. So this is that mailbox uh, shared mailbox searching module, right? Um, we should see that we get access to you know obviously our own account, right? Deckard has access to their own account, um, but we also <clears throat> should see that we have access to Roy's account as well. 
And then, you know, from there, we could run the git dash inbox module, uh, which we haven't gotten to the mailbox stuff yet really yet, but um, there's multiple modules for just pulling data from accounts. And this is one of those. So in git dash inbox will pull all the latest uh, mails. So that is that demo. All right, moving on. We're getting there, I promise. I know it's lots of stuff, sorry. <laughs> all right, so why is that important, right? Why is that whole thing important? If a user changes their password, right? The application is not affected at all, right? So as long as I have a refresh token that is valid, uh, which um, by default will last 90 days, I can still leverage that, that refresh token under the context of the application to access that user's account with his permissions we, we consented to. Um, if all sessions are revoked, so if you go to like the you know admin portal or even the user themselves revokes their sessions, that will kill the refresh token, but the access token will still stay valid as long as it was initially scoped for, which by default is one hour. All right, so you remember how I said external unverified apps can't really fish for much, right? Well, what if we did the exact same thing internally now, right? So take this exact same concept of deploying an app, right, inside of an account. Um, it turns out that you can leverage uh, more permissions to fish within a same, the same tenant itself, right? So we deploy an app, give it mail.read permissions that we previously couldn't do externally. Um, and then now we can leverage that to fish used internally. And that, you know, looks like list of consent grant is back on the mini boys. Um, which is nice post-compromise method. The other thing too to consider with that is that if we deploy an application and we give it permissions, um, unless the organization goes and actually manually deletes that application, we're gonna be able to leverage that for phishing for as long as we want. It's gonna exist in their tenant. And like, you know, we could be kicked out of the, the account we got initial compromise with, right? But as long as the application is still there, we're going to be able to leverage it within their tenant to fish other users. All right, pillage. All right, so now we're getting into the pillaging section, right? So we always got to like look for data, right? So searching and exporting of email, searching and downloading files. All right, so the gist of this whole thing is, right, <clears throat> if you have ever used Snaffler, um, so the, the tool on an internal domain that will go and search share, shares on the network, right, and try to find um, sensitive data, tries to find access keys, um, tries to find, um, you know, uh, passwords and documents, that kind of stuff. Um, basically, we ended up writing a version of Snaffler, but for SharePoint and OneDrive and Teams and email. Um, so that's that's pretty much what we're going to walk through here, hopefully pretty quickly, because we only have 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, all right. So um, first up, searching your own user's emails for terms. Um, so, you know, throw back to Mail Sniper, right? Um, Mail Sniper days. That's like kind of where this whole idea originally came from. Uh, just searching through mail, trying to find interesting stuff. It does have the ability to um, open them in a browser as well, which is nice. Um, <clears throat> or you can export the latest emails. Uh, so if you want to just export everything, the latest stuff, you can do that. You can search Teams messages, right? So you can search, um, you know, through through DMs uh, that have been sent to a user. Or you can export full conversations. Uh, you can search user attributes. So this one um, <clears throat> is is interesting because. Um, <clears throat> Occasionally, help desk or whoever's creating accounts or whoever's managing a domain for that matter, um, sometimes create se secrets or sensitive data within actual um, attributes, right? So like if you open up like the user attributes for a user, um, you know, you a lot of times you have like comment fields, you have description fields, description, information fields, yeah. things like that. And um, in this case, it does the exact same thing, but in Azure, right? So an intra ID where we search through every user attribute and try to identify things like passwords that have been set um, within those fields. All right, so the cool thing about SharePoint, um, or uh, let me rephrase that. The cool thing about searching literally anything in uh, with the Microsoft Graph API is it has this thing called the Graph Search API. So the Graph Search API allows you to use uh, KQL, it's keyword query language, um, which allows you to pass like typical like Google dork type uh, terms. So like file type colon txt or file type colon docx and password, right? And so you can search for you know files or documents that have password in them. Um, so I ended up building a uh, kind of a default detectors uh, file that has a lot of the same uh, dtext that um, Snaffler was using. Uh, similar stuff like trying to find AWS keys, um, Azure secrets, um, SSH keys, lots of stuff like that, um, and gives you gives you kind of like that kind of Snaffler esque type of searching through um, through through SharePoint sites. Gives you the option to download files. Um, it does give you limited content for you as well. 
And then Steve found something very, very interesting. <laughs> I'll let him take over here. Yeah, sure. So um, sitting down with Bo, going over Graph Runner one day, um, decided to uh, poke around myself, opened up Burp Suite. Uh, bro, I started browsing his test uh, SharePoint and just looking around at the documents on there and found a text document that I clicked on. I couldn't open it because conditional access blocked me and said that I was on an unmanaged device. Uh, so I was on my VM in a Firefox browser attempting to uh, browse something on SharePoint. And then um, I looked up on the top left corner and noticed that there was an open drop down. So I hit the open drop down for the text file. And there was another option there called Immersive Reader. Uh, immersive Reader is Microsoft's version of like text to speech. Um, so capturing that request, I clicked on uh, Immersive Reader and then lo and behold, the document that I couldn't open before displayed using immersive reader. Um, I could hit play and hear it or just read it on the screen. So I went back and looked at that burp suite uh, request, found that it went to a different API, put it into some PowerShell code, and now we can read files on SharePoint that are blocked by conditional access for unmanaged devices. Not only text files, but other things like Python files and whatever else you can read. Um, by default, if you browse to it in the browser, the immersive option won't be there for other file types, but you, we can just modify the API requests and get them that way. So quick win. Yeah, so we, we have a question in uh, Discord. So this one, I'll, I'll let you, see, Steve, answer this. And again, MS does not consider this a vulner vulnerability. No, this is a feature, and it's, it's by design, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's text-to-speech, you know, like or speech-to-text, yeah. right? It's, um, you know, it's, uh, it's meant to be there, um, and that's... Oh, John jumped up. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's the thing is like a lot of this stuff, right? Like pretty much everything that we're touching here is stuff that's meant to be used. It's just, we're kind of abusing it, right? Like we're using it in a different way. Um, it's, it's stuff that it, like, if you look at it, like it's there for a reason. Um, and it just ha so happens that like having a cred and knowing how to get to the stuff in, in an interesting or at least efficient way, right? Um, can enable attackers to get this. And it, it looks really bad, right? Like it, it looks like it's a really <laughs> bad thing that should need to be fixed. Um, so uh, one of the the all-encompassing modules in GraphRunner is literally called invoke-graphrunner. So this one automates a lot of the modules um, and, in, and basically kind of runs through that. Um, that uh, Here, let me do the demo for you, that uh, kind of Snaffler-esque uh, type of scenario. All right, so let me pull up the fourth demo here. And we can show you exactly what that uh, immersive file reader um, piece looks like. <laughs> uh, can't never could says bypassing M365 CA is not considered a vulnerability. Say what now? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> uh, get that SharePoint site URLs. Uh, first of all, we'll show you a lot of the site uh, SharePoint sites you have access to currently. Um, if you run invoke dash search SharePoint and OneDrive, um, what it will do is it will take a search term. In this case, we took the term password and it will pull up every file that has password um, in the name or within the content itself. Even OCR to PDFs too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can OCR PDFs. Um, so in this case, I tried to download this Java db.jsp file, right? Got denied, right? It says remote, remote server returned at 403. Let's try another one, right? So AWS credentials.txt, that looks that looks great, right? So again, we're gonna enter the option to download. Oh, this one's credentials.xml. Um, let's try the AWS credentials.txt. Same thing. Um, do we want to download any more files? Uh, no. So, you know, it's not working. And if we go to SharePoint, you can see here, your organization's security policy doesn't allow you to download, print, or sync from the site. You click AWS mm -hmm. credentials, access blocked, right? You can't download files. You can't even open the files in SharePoint here. Um, now let's try via immersive file reader, right? <laughs> Again, there to help, right? The, the, the immersive file reader is there to help text the speech, right? So what we need is the, um, the drive ID and the file ID, which GraphRunner will spit both those out for you whenever you run that search module. So the drive ID, paste that in, and then we need the file ID. So these are unique, uh, unique variables tied to, um, uh, tied to each uh, individual file that's stored mm -hmm. in uh, SharePoint. So file ID, paste that in, give it tokens, dollar tokens, and all of a sudden now we have what? readability, right, to these access keys. 
Obviously, there are example <laughs> access keys here, um, but we can read them. <laughs> um, so kind of bypassing that, you know, download restriction, right? Um, I'm going to show you real quick the kind of like Snappler-esque uh, capability. So this is basically like that Snappler-esque kind of run uh, where we're trying to basically look for things like AWS keys, private keys. And you see how it finds matches, right? Found two matches for, for password manager, found two passes for packet capture, found four matches for unattended install files, and then generates a, a CSV for you um, that has all of the information you need about each one of those files. Um, so it's got the detector name. So you can see, you know, okay, it was AWS keys I found um, or, or image deployment files or password manager or whatever. It gives the actual file name they, that it found. It gives you that drive item ID and file ID. Um, gives you the location. So you can literally take it to, to a browser and go directly to it if you want to. Um, but then it also gives you the size of the file too. So you don't go downloading like, you know, massive, <laughs> you know, terabyte file or whatever. All right, moving on. The, but wait, there's more. <laughs> <laughs> All right. so. <laughs> ended up making a little GUI. All right, so Graphner has a GUI for some common tasks. It doesn't do everything, right? So like I said, the 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 meat and potatoes of this whole thing is in that PowerShell script. Um, <clears throat> but there's occasions where, uh, you know, we maybe have compromised a user's credential or have access to a token. Like Steve was just mentioning the device code phishing, right? In that case, we end up with an access token. And to be able to just take that access token and throw it in a, in a browser and then start clicking around um, can be really nice. So. It does a lot of things. It has the ability to send custom API requests, enumerate users and groups. Um, you can search and read email, um, <clears throat> Teams messages, and SharePoint. And I got a quick demo for that one, real quick. Just gonna show you how that looks. Uh, I got another question for you there, Steve, that I got yes. tagged in. Is denying immersive file reader access a different permission? I don't see anywhere you can deny immersive file reader access anywhere. Mm. Could be, I mean, might be there, but don't know where. Yeah, so this the GUI here, um, basically what we did we need to do is just take the access token, right? So remember, everything's graph driven uh, you know, with access tokens. You can parse it. So if you've ever used like JWT.io, um, this similar type of parsing, right, on the JWT to at least give you your you know name, all the scope, right? <clears throat> so everything's driven by scope. Every single request has to have a certain scope. Um, I, I did see there was a question earlier talking about scope. Um, so yes, I mean, to answer that question, uh, I can't remember who asked it earlier. Um, you have to have like uh, certain permissions to do certain things. In each one of these modules, right? So fetching emails, right? Mail.readBasic, Mail.read, those types of permissions. Um, so this would be reading somebody's email, right? Clicking through, clicking on an email, looking at them. <clears throat> Here's the kicker. If you read an email via the Graph API, just like I'm showing you in this in this demo here, it does not actually mark that email as read in that user's inbox. So you can very sneakily <clears throat> go about reading emails here. You can search through email. Um, <clears throat> I see there's like a million <laughs> O faces <laughs> popping up in Zoom. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, <clears throat> you can read other users' email, right? So in that case, we could read Roy's earlier, right? Um, <clears throat> So reading another user's email, same thing. You can click through those and start to uh, start to to you know analyze you know somebody else's inbox. Um, you can fetch Teams chats. So you need a compromised user and you want to read what they're reading in Teams. You can just click on conversations and all of a sudden you have their whole history with another user. Um, you know even messages back and forth, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then ultimately, if you wanted to, you can send messages too. So you'd click on one of these Teams chats. And then, um, oh yeah, I have a password there, right? Uh, then go down to this box where you can type your message and you can send. So you can send directly as that user to the, to the Teams chat via the Graph API as well. <clears throat> I know it's like, it's a super basic little GUI, but um, honestly, like it's nice to just be able to kind of click through a lot of this stuff, um, especially if you're trying to work fast, right? Um, <clears throat> the O faces are still coming through. <laughs> it's killing me. Uh, um, all right, so. Uh, one OneDrive. Uh, you got OneDrive files. You got shared uh, OneDrive shared files. Mm -hmm. um, SharePoint too. Um, you can download the files. You can you know navigate through the various directories. Mm -hmm. Anyways, you get the idea there. I know we're like kind of near the end one here, minute. so I'm gonna yeah. wrap up the demo. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so, so I'm gonna leave you guys with some resources. Um, so resources, Cloud and Test Cheat Sheets that I put together. Um, I pretty much keep all my notes here for any type of uh, you know Azure, AWS, GCP, that kind of stuff. Um, any any sorts of like command line uh, tactics. Um, there's a, a permissions reference list here that I think is great. A lot of that highlights a lot of those default permissions we talked about today. 
um, that you need to probably go turn off, um, or at least you know analyze why they're why they're enabled. Um, and then you got to give shouts out to Road Tools, Adderhound, and AAD internals. You know, without without them, uh, kind of paving the ground for a lot of this. Um, that, you know, wouldn't be here, right? Um, so code is live now, right? Um, you know, you can go check it out. Um, we are absolutely open to collaboration too. Uh, so if you guys, you know, have any cool uh, new new modules you want to add in or have any ideas. We've got a couple added days. the last two days. Yeah, yeah. Just even within the last couple of days, um, we've got a couple of new ones in there. Uh, there's the wiki. So if you want to learn how to use it, right? So the majority of the instructions are in the wiki uh, that are on GitHub as well. And then we have a very lengthy blog post. Uh, like if you want to kind of dive into Thanks, everything sir. we talked about today, like very, very lengthy uh, blog post there as well. Woo. And that's pretty much it, guys. I, and you know, scene. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> So many questions. <laughs> do we have time or do you want to just? Yeah, yeah. let's do some questions. Hey, here, okay. Before we wrap up, John, let's give your thoughts on this tool that we've created and in the least shilly way possible <laughs> that we at Black Hills offer pen testing services. So John, go ahead. Oh, uh, you need a pen test? Call us. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There we go. Uh. Yeah. So so like, like I said, in the onset, you know, we as an industry need to start looking at the cloud and the browser as like the next frontier that pen testers need to go. I, I get into a bit of a concern where we get so wrapped up into active directory post exploitation endpoint, because that's what we've been told that we need to do as pen testers. And one of the things that I, I really drive on is if we allow that to be the definition then essentially what's going to happen is the whole automated pen test like group of people are going to win, right? If they can define it as those terms. But if we keep pushing the envelope in the cloud, if we keep pushing the envelope, uh, we've got a webcast coming up. We don't know how we're going to put it together, but we have literally a pen test where we were completely skunked and the internal chat, um, AI chat that a company had basically walked us through how to hack their environment. Right. So when we're looking, this goes into the snake oil summit, we need to be looking at these new technologies and kind of how that relates to us as security professionals. And I do believe that a lot of the tools that are out there that are automated pen testing tools are fantastic. They're going to automate a lot of the stuff that we've been doing for years, but that doesn't mean that that's it. That's done. We're done with the pen test. It means that it's automated those things so that we can start researching and trying to find new things out there. And that's where we need to be. Um, it's just really, really just super cool, uh, for us to do this. And that's, that's our jobs. That's what we need to be doing as security professionals. Um, I, I had to step out. I'm dealing with some things. Did you guys get a chance to show the malicious app that you can create, uh, for internal spear phishing? Yes, oh, yeah. we did. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's awesome. So very <laughs> Yeah. Yep. Um, but once again, that's where we have to be, the cloud and the browser. So if you're just getting started and you're like, where do I need to go in my career? The cloud and the browser. Like you need to be looking at those two things because they are truly the new frontiers. Um, and also a lot of this was driven from our continuous pen testing service, which Corey uh, kind of heads up. We ran this on all of our continuous pen testing customers where you don't just pen test in a snapshot in time. It gives our team time and Steve to be is also part of that team to jump in. Um, and Caitlin's part of that team where we can actually now try to break into a company continuously over an entire year. And when something new comes up, we can hit these things. So that's going to be another webcast where the relationship of what we do in pen testing needs to fundamentally change as well, away from two weeks, a month or whatever we do to trying to open that, that space up to maybe starting up relationships that are year long with good firms. Uh, good firms like, you know, Red Siege is a fantastic fantastic firm, right? Trusted Sec is a fantastic firm. BHIS, of course, we do that too. And um, it, it's just something that I think that this industry needs to start going. So when you're looking at this, please jump in, help, contribute, um, but also understand that this is a directional change that we think that we need to make in the industry as well. Yeah. So, all right, let's so, get to some real questions for the people yeah, that know what they're talking about. Let's do the, that's the official end of the webcast. If you got to go, go, we understand. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you ever need a red team thread hunt, pen test, uh, continuous pen testing, you know where to find us. Uh, all right. So, blah, 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 blah. okay. So we're in post-show banter now. Okay. <laughs> questions. Woo, go questions. Through, uh, post-show. I, I, question. I have some yeah. questions from the audience that I have, I dismissed and answered a lot of them, but there's some ones in here that are interesting. So 
One says, our, let's say hypothetically that a red team has compromised an intra ID and is attempting to fool conditional access. Does GraphRunner allow for cloning device IDs? Uh, I would say no. Um, <clears throat> that I so would probably need some research, but I mean, in general, like if it's if it's a device that's known and already tied to a user, then no. Um, I don't I don't believe you could do that. However, you don't need to clone a device IDs usually because you can just set it to edge on Windows. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, someone said, can you estimate access for other users? Oh, that's a good question. Ooh. Ooh. Um, so I will try it. I will try it. <laughs> <laughs> that's, why, uh, that's why that's so why we do can... casts in front of a thousand people. Yeah, right? Good ideas, ideas. right? Ideas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that was Max Forbridge's question. I, I sorry, Max, for the non shout out there. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, do any uh, Arcadi Arcadio Aguilar says, do any of these te techniques generate abnormal logs? Something in UAL or Sentinel that can tip off defenders that this is happening? Yeah, in fact, uh, there was a pretty good blog post written up just the other day. I'm gonna I'll paste it in the um, uh, the chat. There was a company <laughs> uh, I think it's Invictus uh, Instant Response. They wrote a they actually it's just part one. So like a massive blog post talking about uh, the blue teamer side of Graph Runner. Mm -hmm. Um, nice. So I will paste that in. Um, they they basically That's walk cool. through. Yeah, they walk through and and basically try to highlight all of the alerts. Um, and and actually not necessarily alerts, but the logs that it generates. Right. So you can. And that's so cool. So the answer is yes. I like you <laughs> believe you need uh, the license and the logging you turned on, which might be. Yep. That's true. true. If you have E three, we'll talk to you in November. Oh, okay. <laughs> I love uh, conundrums. Question: Did Google Cloud Compute sponsor Graph Runner R and D? <laughs> uh, believe it or not, the Graph Runner R and D was sponsored by our customers, who are so uh, masochistic that they want to be hacked using stuff like yeah, this. Yeah, our customers get weird. Like they're like, <laughs> is, there, is there something that you can you can try that's really going to hit us hard? We're like, uh, yeah, and then we do it, and we're like, well, we don't know how to fix it. Here, here man. Like, <laughs> we don't care. We still want to know. <laughs> Put this ball in my mouth. What? What? <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> yeah, chain me up to the radiator in the basement, and I'll pay you. Um, so basically someone uh, also Arcadio Aguilar asked can let anyone read my email or share my inbox can that feature be limited or controlled oh, oh so, uh, yeah I think so mm, I, I would hope so <laughs> Bramblethorn84 asked which admin group is the real one um, the one with them. the permissions the one with the permissions um Okay, uh, when this happens, users will get an email that says they're added to an email, or sorry, a group or team. Um, d like, are you aware of any users that are being targeted with this getting emails? I, I haven't seen any of that. You know, well, I if you if you do a BOSED and add a guest user, they won't get the email. Your guest user will. Um, right. When you've so it's added. like the target will. So don't add like your boss, but add right. like the thing you <laughs> control. Yeah. Someone asked a, basically the... The funny example they gave is if I create badminton as a username and invite them to a tenant, will they be added to the dynamic tenant? Yeah, I answered dynamic? that. If it matches the rule, it should, yeah. So there, are, I guess to expand the question, the rule, are there yeah. any rules by default is the question. No. no. Okay. Well, so you, actually they, all users. I think all users. So just, yeah, to get added okay. to the tenant. So, so the answer is unless someone has set up a dynamic uh, group, there will, nothing will happen. But if someone does set it up, I mean, that's why the tool exists. Um, let's see. Uh, that's most of the question. I think there was a couple of good ones. Someone asked, like, "Hey, I'm an MSP. How do I baseline my cloud environment and set it up securely?" And I think mm. John took that one was like, "Call us. This is too big yeah. of a question to answer." <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's a lot of questions about uh, you know, how to protect, how to defend. So that blog is really covering a lot of those. Mm. Um, you know, one one big thing, right? So. If you if you go to the Azure portal, um, you can do a lot of this there, right? So there's a checkbox to turn that off via the Azure portal, right? So lot, like pretty much everything that I showed you today is stuff you literally could go click through and manually like do. Um, it's all functionality that's there, but you can turn that off. Now the the flip side of that is disabling access to the Azure portal does not block access to the Azure or to the uh, the Microsoft Graph API. Um, the so at the at the heart of Graph Runner, right? Like the the soul of how it actually works is all because you can access the Graph API. Now, if you were to 
create a conditional access policy that blocks the graph API for the majority of your user base, not gonna be able to use it. So mm. um, definitely worth something worth testing, right? Um, seeing if there's you know potential around that uh, for you. Uh, but in general, if you block the graph API for the majority of users, they're not gonna be able to um, leverage this tool. Yeah. Yep. Uh, here's a good question that just came in. Do we currently have any private features that we haven't released in the tool? <laughs> um, I mean, yes, all the good stuff. <laughs> no, I hang on, digs through my barrel of private tools. <laughs> Basically, do you have any stuff that the, what do we what do we call it? Shiv code that it works once. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what's can we get the broken things? Because that's what you I do have, on GitHub. You put I your broken shit out there so people can complain that your code is broken. No, so you know, doing this whole thing, right? Like, I, I, I mean, Steve has access to this list too. Um, we built like a list of like to dos, um, and a lot of that is like hunches, right? It's like hunches of things that, like, from an R and D perspective, like we're gonna go down, we're gonna explore these paths, and we're I saw probably this one weird request. Stuff. Yeah, like it's it's stuff that we're probably gonna find other stuff too. Um, like a lot of it's like like I would say like high likelihood of us finding other cool shit, um, but it's not necessarily something that's public yet, right? Stuff that we haven't actually, you know. Yeah, I mean, we left, we didn't really release the techniques until the tool was released. And since then, I can say that I haven't done any new research to put anything new that I'm holding back. Other users are starting to add new stuff we hadn't added yet. So that's good. But but even though, you you know, you say that, but I remember whenever Bo first started talking about this conceptually, like where it started conceptually and where it ended as a tool, I think that there's probably 10 times more features and things like once Bo got into it, it just kind of started exploding. Oh, yeah. And then once you got in, it started exploding. And that, I don't think that that research is done yet. Right. Oh, like no. there's still, there's still more in this undiscovered country green fields to kind of continue to R and D. And I think one of the reasons why we do release these tools, right. We could totally keep this as a BHIS only tool and be like, this is elite magic that just BHIS has, mm -hmm. but we're huge proponents of open source because, mm -hmm. you know, I say it all the time, things are only fragile till they break and then they get stronger by putting this out there, getting more people to run it, doing more research, adding more features then maybe just maybe we're going to get Microsoft to acknowledge that some of these things are actual bugs that need to be fixed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that, that progress is incremental, right? And we kind of touched on this a little bit, but this is the entire research and development model of our continuous pen testing service. This is why it exists. Basically, there are certain customers that we have that are like, we want you to develop these tools in our environment as you're working. Um, those, you know, top of the pain pyramid customers of, we want you to find things that are impossible to fix just because we're that uh scoped into trying to fix things so like that's it's not that we have private features it's just that when we develop things sometimes we use test environments of course but sometimes we use our customer environments and we inform them along the way mm -hmm. hey uh you know your your environment has this stuff that we've never seen anywhere else so take a look <laughs> <laughs> and, and sometimes that's as far as we get it's just hey go investigate these uh, policies, conditional access, et cetera. Conditional access itself at this point is the gatekeeper for almost all of this stuff. And it mm -hmm. is a huge just field of uh, research of different policies and how companies allow what they allow, all that stuff. It's And it's you can do it in a lab, but at the end of the day, you know, the CEO needs email from China. So now there's that, that's in a conditional access policy, right? Like that's mm -hmm. the scary part. But. And Archangel asked, does BHI have connections with Microsoft where you can directly show them what you found? I know that, Steve, you've had some conversations with them at least, but I don't think that we have like a they direct- have MSRC and I have friends there. I mean, the bottom line is going through the proper chain isn't working. But, but, but once again, that's our job as pen testers, right? Yeah, We're we just, keep pushing that, yeah. yeah. And yeah, this is the first time, it, by the way, one of the tools that Bo's worked on where people are like, no, 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 that's not a bug. That's a feature. That's the way yes. it's supposed to be. And, and things change over time. This is yeah. how secu security is, the world of security is evolving to configuration-based vulnerabilities, yes. not as much mm -hmm. patchable. True. Why, why does EDR allow certain viruses to run? Well, that's because certain tools require those things to run, right? Like yep. it, it's basically at the end of the day, code execution is also a user doing their job. So it's the same thing with cloud, like conditional access being open to the internet is also Stacy from accounting, accessing your email to make sure that payroll gets out on time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so it's not 
Microsoft can't be like, hey, we just turned off this feature and then come the, all their customers. Will be like, people, right? Yeah, they're like, oh, well, we can't get to our email now. So we're going to switch to Google. So I guess our so company can, you know. will die now. <laughs> so, yeah. But you all don't work the booth as much as I do at a conference, but I have other vendors come up and say, thanks for that webcast. That you all did. Well, there's already people That's, on Discord. They're like, I just so happen to have a pen test coming up where this will be useful. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I can almost guarantee you're going to find something interesting in it, right? Yeah, I put yeah. A, a tweet out not too long after we released the tool, like two days and said, like, uh, if you've ran the tool, did you find something new? Uh, yes or no. And then otherwise, I haven't ran the tool. And it was like 80 or 90 percent yes and like two, you know, very low percent of um, no who ran the tool and didn't find anything. It's very likely you will. Yeah, yeah we, that, we have so, on-prem exchange, so we're more secure. It's fine. Don't worry about <laughs> it. So that was a know, joke. For the for the researchers in the room, right? Like people who are interested in doing research and stuff, like this is actually one of those moments that like it's re such a fulfilling thing to like finally release something and then see other people find stuff that you know, like you like, you know, internally, like we've been we've used been using it for CPT customers, right? And so like mm -hmm. I know like it's it's valuable, right? But like once it's public and we see other, you know, other people like saying, hey. I just ran this and found, you know, a bunch of PHI in my environment or, Hey, I just ran this and, yeah. you know, got access to this, you know, tenant. Yeah. It's like, it's so fulfilling, like from the research side. So if you are looking at researching something like do it, you know, and, um, yeah, we can't pen test everyone. <laughs> It's just that simple. <laughs> yeah. Like the, the reason to go public with your tooling is because it makes everyone more secure because we can't, we can do a lot of pen tests, but the community as a whole could do 10 or a hundred times more in yeah. two and, weeks. And that's the goal, right? Um, and I also, you know, we're not, we're not lost on the fact that this is an arms race, right? You, we're looking at a lot of the breaches we talk about in the news on Mondays. There's a lot of vulnerabilities that the adversaries are taking advantage of in these cloud technologies, right? Uh, you know, looking at what's going on with Okta over the past two months is a really good example. And a lot of the vulnerabilities that this basically pulls down, it's just a matter of time before the adversaries are starting to nail those as well. So one of the things I love about this tool is it's not just an offensive tool. It's you can use it as an auditor, right? Like you can totally mm -hmm. use this as an audit, as an auditing tool and you should be. Um, yeah. And that's the goal. Once yes. again, remember folks, our only job as pen testers is to make our lives harder. That's it. That's our, every morning we wake up, how do we make what we do more difficult, difficult going forward? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think today we made some great successes in that. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Is that a good place to call it? I think that's a good place. All right. Bo and Steve, fantastic job. Um, Corey, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming and hanging out. And as always, Jason and Deb, uh, thank you for driving this. And more important, everybody that shows up and sticks around for the post-show banter. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. And we'll keep coming because you keep coming. So thanks so much. We'll see you on our next webcast. All right, Ryan. Bye, Kill it with fire, Ryan. Kill it with fire, Ryan, for making us look Kill good. It. Come on, Ryan. <laughs> Do it.